Good morning. morning. The day has finally arrived. The day we've been waiting for for a very long time in this classroom. Um, in the sense that uh, our VC, we would like to uh, extend a very warm welcome from TST um, Teaching Studies 4 um, in the Faculty of Education to you. And we really appreciate the fact that you're making the time to come and join us in our classroom today. Um, another guest uh, whom you've heard of and now get to meet and see is uh, Professor Erika um, Kramer Mbula, who has got a Saatchi chair at UJ. And in particular, we have spoke of some of the work that Erika is doing, but I think that she's going to start to connect the dots with our main question, which, is, um, which you all know very well and we're going to go through in a minute. So I would really like with that to extend a very warm welcome to our guests and especially to all of you as well because there are going to be a series of students who are going to participate uh, within this conversation as well. So Sipiwe, Marcel, Sinatemba and others who are going to be contributing, I extend a warm welcome to you um, and, and really want to say thank you for being so brave and courageous to stand in the same forum as the VC and Prof. Um, so with that, um, a very um, sort of short um, overview of uh, the way the, day, uh, the morning will proceed. Um, a slight change in plan from what I said to you before. We are going to have our Vice Chancellor address us first and then Professor Erika will uh, connect the dots with Ideal Teacher and the work that she's doing. And then we'll have an opportunity for our students to share a few things that have been a part of conversation in this class. And then I really want to start to then pull together some of the pieces that you have contributed to around our problematizing of Ideal Teacher um, for the South African context. And then, after, uh, of course, after that, you are most welcome um, to then have a chance to have your voice into the room as well. So, uh, Prof Mbula and uh, uh, Prof um, Erika, um, the main question that this entire module has been built on uh, has grown actually. We started with who is an ideal teacher in an ideal classroom for an ideal school, and then another guest by, by way of Mr. Linford Mouladi who won the uh, DBE Teacher of the Year Award in the category of technology brought into our classroom the concept of ideal community uh, in the South African context within the era of 4IR. So the concept of ideal, you will see it repeated a number of times and of course the dictionary has got a particular meaning and overview of what ideal is, but in this classroom we are really problematizing and going through different aspects of rethinking thinking rethinking learning, rethinking knowledge, rethinking pedagogy, rethinking all the kinds of things that education students have done over the course of three years to come up with some common understandings. We are not saying that these are going to be understandings that are generalizable or universally appropriate, but what we are saying for this particular group of students, from their experience as future teachers, both theoretically and practically, who is ideal? And what is emerging from the work that we're doing is conceptualizations around ideal is really, really being focused around ideal teacher. Because in the South African context, the best resource any school has is a teacher who is able to show adaptive expertise, who is technologically literate, and who can bring the world into the classroom and the classroom into the world. So with that, I'd like to invite Prof. Marwala, who will uh, now take over with his presentation. Prof, I'm sorry, there's a bit of um, technology to deal with here. Does this work? Hey, San Bonan. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? No, thank you very much. I am quite glad to be back in the classroom. Uh, you know, I, I really have enjoyed my career as a teacher. I used to teach uh, uh, at another university that deserves no mention. It is in Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and I used to teach a, a course called uh, Control. It does help a little bit on, on how we can be able to control and guide the uh, students. And I also used to teach a course called Artificial Intelligence. So now, this morning, what I really wanted to just do is to provoke your thinking about uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Not too long ago, uh, somebody wrote to, uh, uh, to me on, on Facebook, and he said, uh, the fourth industrial revolution can wait. I don't think it can wait. Uh, I don't think the world is going to wait for you uh, to, to adapt. It will move on. And unless you adapt to the changes that are happening in the fourth industrial revolution, especially in teaching, then you're going to be left behind. So this is really a, a, a talk where I'm just going to be talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And I will leave you with questions as to how do we prepare our students in order for them to thrive uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. So, maybe let me just do this. I, present, I, I had two presentations for you. Um, after looking at you, I realized that you deserve a much more advanced presentation, uh, which is what I'm going to... So how many of you have heard of the word the fourth industrial revolution? Now, can anyone tell me what the fourth industrial revolution is? Yeah, I can see a gentleman there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you. Uh, what do you think the fourth industrial revolution is? Okay. <laughs> okay. You see, no, no, I mean, this is, he, he has it. It's industrial. The change is about industrial, but why is it the fourth? Is the fourth because there was the first, the second, and the third. That is the reason why it is called uh, the fourth industrial revolution. It is basically changing absolutely everything around us. So what has happened is that we had the first industrial revolution. And before the first industrial revolution, uh, human beings had not perfected the use of machines to improve production. So the first industrial revolution happened in England. Can you believe it? Uh, uh, England is not a, a big place. It's an island, by the way. The United Kingdom is an island. And, uh, and I was a student, I was a PhD student there, I even taught. I uh, studied my academic career there. And if you just wander to a pub and you interact with the British, you probably will be wondering, how in the world did such people conquer the world? And the reason was because before the first industrial revolution, there was a scientific revolution. That gave us Newton. How many of you know who Newton is? Uh, that gave us James Watt. How many of you know who James Watt is? I'm impressed. You are a very impressive uh, uh, audience. Now, because of the first industrial revolution, human beings started making machines to do things that were supposed to be done by human beings. So when this happened, not everybody was happy. A group of people called the Luddites organized themselves. Uh, their mission was to go and destroy the machines that were taking away their jobs. 
Uh, of course, the Luddites, many of them were hanged. And the first industrial revolution moved on. Now, the second industrial revolution happened with the ideas that were created in Britain, but were industrialized in the United States. This concept called electromagnetism. How many of you uh, know about electromagnetism? How many of you know what a magnet is? <laughs> All of you know what a magnet is. So basically, electromagnetism uh, principles uh, is uh, merges electricity and a magnet. So if you have a magnet and you have something that conducts electricity like copper, if you put them together and you move a copper wire next to a magnet, what happens? Electricity is generated, isn't it? You know? And that's how ESCOM, by the way, generates electricity. They take coal, they heat water, steam comes out. The steam moves a large conductor that is next to a magnet, and electricity is generated. Now, if you have electricity, you can be able to generate electricity. You take a magnet, and you have a copper wire, and you put electricity in the copper wire. What happens to the copper wire? Eh? It moves. That is what you call an electric motor. And an electric motor is what powers our industry. If you go to a manufacturing plant, you will realize that things are moving and they are being produced and, uh, and move, moving, and they are using an, elect um, uh, an electric motor. So because of this, uh, human beings were now able to produce mass production of goods and services. So you could be able to go and produce a thousand of things in a very short space of time. Before I became um, a professor, I used to brew beer, Mkomboti, at the university, at, at, at South African breweries. And uh, when I was doing that, in Port Elizabeth, Ebai, they had a brewery that used to employ 4,000 people. We automated that brewery. It can operate with 35 people. And it produces more and more alcohol than when it employed 4,000 people. Because that is mass production of goods and services using an assembly line, but also using a robot. So the third industrial revolution was the one that gave us the semiconductor industry. Semiconductor is something that conducts electricity under certain conditions. So what normally used to happen, um, uh, uh, we used to believe that either something conducts electricity or it doesn't. Wood does not conduct electricity, but copper does conduct electricity. But we found out that there is a material in between that conducts electricity when you shine light into it. They are called semiconductors. And because of that, they became efficient switches. You could be able to switch it on and off much more efficiently. And because of that, we could be able to build computers which basically use ones and zeros to be able to do computation, to allow you to go on Facebook, for example. It's a digital computer. But of course, the concept of digital was invented before. Uh, how many of you know what a telegram is? How, why do you know about a telegram? You are, the young, uh, you are young people. You know. So basically a telegram was uh, a technology where you could communicate with people by switching on and off. So you will have somebody on one post office, they will take your message, they will put it into ones and zeros, then they will switch on and off and on and off, and then somebody on the other side will, will see whether it is, if it is off, it's a zero. If it is on, it's a one. And, and then they just write ones, zeros and ones. And they will basically take those ones and zeros into the words that was originally uh, actually uh, uh, communicated. It's called a telegram. And the difference between the telegram is, is that in the post office, they used to employ people who will read those ones and zeros. A computer does that. 
It was digital technology, but it was being done by human beings. Now it is being done by machines. Now, we are living in what is called the fourth industrial revolution. In the fourth industrial revolution, technologies such as artificial intelligence are going to change the world. They are going to change all aspects of our lives. How many of you know what artificial intelligence is? It's basically the art of making machines think like a human being. Because they think like a human being, they do things that a human being is supposed to do. So this is really what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. Now, what is artificial intelligence? You have many different types of artificial intelligence. You have what you call soft computing. By the time you finish here, you will be an expert in soft computing. Uh, you have what is called computational intelligence. You have what is called machine learning. And within machine learning, you have what is called deep learning. By the way, if you really want to know more about this, go and buy this book. It's one of the best books in the market. I wrote it so you can get it on Amazon. Please go and buy it. <laughs> now, this is an example of what soft computing is able to do. This is an article that was published on New Scientist in 2007. 12 years ago, uh, uh, on an invention that we made uh, at that point, we basically taught a machine to play a card game called poker game. And poker, the best poker uh, players are players that are able to bluff. That's how po you play uh, 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 poker. So this machine actually learned how to bluff which is actually uh, quite uh, uh, an interesting thing. And I'm not bluffing, by the way. <laughs> and bluffing and the detection of bluffing is a very important concept. Insurance companies employ people in order to detect whether you are bluffing or not. So if you go to, I don't know, you go to auto in general, and you apply for the car insurance, and you go to a party, uh, uh, in your favorite spot, and you drink, what you, you drink what you are not supposed to drink, and you drink a little bit too much, you go back to your car, and you collide with a tree. And then you have to go to the police and report the matter, and you call your insurance and say, I had an accident. So they say, were you drunk? Or did you drink anything you are not supposed to drink and drive? And you say, no. Your no can be detected whether you are bluffing or not. And if they can detect that you are bluffing, then they are not going to pay for the replacement of the car. So this is an example of what we use. We use soft computing. It's the work that I did with my, my student, Dr. Herwitz, uh, at, at that point. It's an example of soft computing. Now, the other type of artificial intelligence is what is called computational intelligence. This, basically, you use at society of, 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 of organisms such as ants, uh, and you use this to build a machine that is intelligent. So on the left-hand side, I took this when I was going home to Limpopo. I just took it outside uh, uh, Pulukwane. Do you know what this thing is? Yeah, we call, in, in, in Tivenda, we call it Chiwuru. So inside these things, you have these ants. You might be wondering, why is he having the ants in his hand? We actually eat them in Limpopo. <laughs> we do eat them. <laughs> we do eat them, you know. And they are very delicious. So now, these small ants, are the organisms that build this complicated ant hill. And in fact, the hill is just the tip of the iceberg. If you go under, you will realize that it is even more complicated. There is a YouTube video, it's not a very nice video, where somebody puts um, 
molten aluminum. It's a metal. You know, it, you, you heat it and it becomes liquid, and, and they put it inside and they dig to see how far it can be able to go. Now, the question that one can ask is, clearly these ants are very intelligent to be able to build such complicated structure. So what people did in artificial intelligence is to, was to say, can we decode how this intelligent works and we create a software that will be intelligent enough to be able to make sense of what is happening around it. It turns out that um, the first person to realize how smart these things was, was actually a South African poet called Eugene Marey. He wrote a, a, a book called The Sylph and the Meal, which basically means the soul of the ants. And uh, obviously he became very famous out of this. So when he uncovered this, he did not publish it in a very well-known journal. He published it in a journal called Hayes Henwood. And as a series of articles, and the Dutch Nobel Prize winner, who obviously could read the uh, Africans, took it as his own work. It was caught, uh, uh, but uh, it was quite uh, surprising that somebody with a Nobel Prize will try to steal these ideas. So now, for those of you who have worked with ants, so you will see at your homes, ants will be forming almost a straight line, isn't it? You know? That is the shortest distance from the nest to where the food is. And taking that, we build something called ant colony optimization, which is what is used in electronic maps to be able to find shortest distances from one point to another. So it's quite an impressive uh, uh, algorithm. Now, um, you have something called machine learning. So machine learning is the use of data to be able to build machines that are intelligent. And one example of machine learning is what you call a neural network. And this neural network is motivated by how a neuron in the brains actually works. And you can give it a set of inputs, and then it will be able to predict the output. And the way it is done is a mathematical equation. I'm not going to explain it. I know you can understand it without my, my explanation. <laughs> now, when the neural network is big, this is what is called deep learning. So deep learning will take sets of inputs, and then it will give you outputs. And for it to be able to predict the correct output, you have to feed it huge amounts of data. If you don't feed it enough data, it will not learn properly. So Facebook uses deep learning to take the image of, your, of, of, of somebody and tells you who that person is. That's why when you load pictures now, it automatically labels who the person is. It uses deep learning. So not too long ago, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Vail and, um, and Oscar uh, van der Merve and Wongani and I went to, to a country in Asia. I'm not going to mention the country because the last time I mentioned it, the ambassador came to my office to complain. So when we arrive in this Asian country, so you arrive with your passport. You are not supposed to be held by a human being. So you put your passport on, the, on, 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 on this machine. It looks at the picture on the passport. It looks at you through the camera. And it verifies that the person it is seeing now is the same person on the passport. As a vice chancellor, I was the first person to, 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 to go in. And then I put my picture, it looks at me, and it says, high corner. I cannot be able to reconcile this man. <laughs> then, then Peter, Peter Vail comes in. He does the same. He says, sharp, sharp, get in. Wongani, uh, the head of uh, Wongani Ulunga, Dr. Wongani Ulunga is the head of uh, 
of Johannesburg Institute of Advanced Study, one of our premier institutes. He puts the same thing and he says high corner. <laughs> then Oscar van der Merve does the same thing, he says sharp sharp. So why is this thing discriminating against Africans? <laughs> And the reason is actually quite simple. The reason is because the data they use was gathered in normally in North America, Europe, and Asia. Not Maslabati where Bongani comes from. <laughs> or Dutuni where I come from. So the representation of data is very important because if we do not, if we do not represent the data well, then it does not work very well. And by the way, if you want to know more about this, um, you, can, you can go and buy uh, my book on, on deep learning. <laughs> so now, so this is an example of uh, a car at a university called KAIST uh, in South Korea. It's a university. It was produced by a university, this car. But this car is being driven by a robot. So this robot can be able to drive. It, it can even be able to kneel. You see, the chief of my village is a woman, and every time I arrive there, I have to fall on my knees. If I take this robot, it will be very respectful of my culture. <laughs> it can open doors. All these things are things that human beings are able to do. It can be even be able to do engineering work. Not too long ago, we lost three firefighters in Johannesburg, one of them from my village. If we have robots like this, why should we send human beings to such dangerous environments? But this thing is able to learn, and it is learning using that machine learning algorithm that I talked about. It is able to sense its environment, it is able to react, it is able to drive, it can almost walk, it can even kneel. Because it can do all these things, it is almost human. And because of that, we call it, it is artificially intelligent. Because it can do things that are done by a human being. But there are many things that it will not be able to do. Do you think it can fall in love? Is it conscious? You know, there are people who say that robots are going to conspire against us. Unless robots become conscious, that is not going to happen. Do you think uh, uh, Nehau can be able to recruit it? <laughs> of course no. And part of the reason why many companies are very attracted to using robots is because they can make it work for 24 hours. It will not complain. But this is not the only aspect of our economy that it is changing. It is changing the world of finance, for example. When you go to a bank today to look for a loan, it's no longer a human being that is processing the information and deciding whether you get a loan or not. It is actually an, an algorithm. And because of that, we all heard about Standard Bank laying off 1,200 workers. They are laying 1,200 workers because the tasks that they used to use human beings to do are now being done by artificial intelligent machines. Now this has all sorts of implications on what we teach. If you are teaching economics today, you have to teach them about demand and supply. You have to teach them about rational expectations. But I think you should teach them about technology. You should teach them about artificial intelligence and its role in finance. The question that we have to uh, we continually ask ourselves is, um, are we as the University of Johannesburg ready? By the way, this is uh, the two books that I wrote on how artificial intelligence is changing the world of finance. The one I wrote it alone, the other one I wrote it with uh, Evan Hewitt. 
This is an example of what it is able to do. Uh, this is a course uh, called Network at Cornell University in the United States. Uh, the reason why I'm using it is because uh, they do teach the theory that we have proposed in artificial intelligence. So you have something called information asymmetry. Uh, a gentleman called um, uh, Akeloff and Stiglitz and Sanger won a Nobel Prize. So basically, uh, they wrote an article called The Markets of Lemon. So you have two car salesmen. One sells good cars, another one sells bad cars. And the customers do not know which one is which. That's why you call it information asymmetry. One party has more information than the other. The customer does not know which car manufacturer, car uh, salesman, used car salesman is good or bad. But they, the car salesman know what quality of cars they are actually uh, uh, selling. Now the question is, what happens to a good car salesman? And uh, these three people, and they won a Nobel Prize for this, actually came to the conclusion that a good car salesman actually gets out of market because he's less likely to give a discount than a bad car salesman. And as a result, uh, information asymmetry destroys the market. So our theory is that once decisions are no longer made by human beings and they are made by artificial intelligent machines, the level of information asymmetry actually decreases. So another example of what uh, 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 th these machines are doing. This is another work that we did quite a number of years ago. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to buy a house. That was maybe 20 years ago. I went to a bank, and then they did credit scoring. At that time, they used to use human beings, uh, and now they no longer use human beings. And after they looked at um, all those things, they said, we are giving you a loan. But what will happen if you die? <laughs> Who's going to service your loan? I said, I don't know. They said, okay, you need to get a life insurance. Okay, that was fine. And then they said, uh, when I apply for the life insurance, they say, I have to take an HIV test. In South Africa, they used to ask people to take HIV tests before they give them insurance. So I went and took the, the test. But I really was wondering, can, can't we create a machine that will be able to do all these things without having to ask people to go and take HIV test? So this is the work that we have done. Uh, we even have a patent on, on, on this type of work. So artificial intelligence is changing the whole field of economics. But it is also changing the field of political science and having all sorts of implications on how we teach uh, political scientists. Do you think Swaziland, no, Eswatini now, will ever go to war with Jamaica. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we wanted to create a machine that will look at any given country and be able to tell you whether these two countries will be able to go to war or not. And of course, this, 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 this algorithm will be based on artificial intelligence. And of course, we did, uh, we did create it and it works very well. Now, given the fact that now we can be able to do that, the question is, how do we train political scientists today so that they are able to thrive in this era? Where they are not, their opinions on whether two countries will go to war or not does not matter because a computer is able to give a better opinion. How do we train them so that they are still relevant? That was really what this book was all about. Of course, it means that when you go and do uh, political science, you will have to take courses in data analytics. You will have to now take courses in artificial intelligence so that you are not left behind. And as the vice chancellor, I have to ask myself, are we doing that at the University of Johannesburg? And if we are not doing it, 
what does it mean for our graduates going into the future? So we wrote a book on this. Um, the Chinese military actually translated it into Mandarin. So I was quite interested to see how are they going to write Marwala, my last name in Chinese. So this is the Chinese translation of the book. So the first character there, Ma, means a horse. The second character, Wa, means uh, the gutter of a roof. You can see a roof at the top and something collecting water. And the last two characters means uh, isla, it means to pull. So the first character is an a, it's a verb, and the second character is a, is a person trying to do something, and the second character is a, is a, is a carriage, and they combined together, it means to pull, you know, quite interesting. Now, you saw that robot that was driving. It has to operate with human beings. It has to operate with human beings. Now, I think the psychology of the future is, going to, is no longer going to be about human beings. It's going to be about how do human beings and machines work together. The human robot interaction is becoming a very important topic. If I was a young man who is thinking of going to do a master's, I will go and do a master's in the psychology of man-machine interaction. The question that we have to ask ourselves as the University of Johannesburg is that are we teaching our psychologists to understand that uh, the person of today works with the machine. Some people have done a study. They, they took phones away from people. Like, for example, I ask you, please give me all your phones, and I go and store them for five hours. And you will come and collect them after five hours. They found out that after five hours, people are no longer in sound psychological state. <laughs> in fact, they found out the brain activity is almost similar to the brain activity of somebody trying to stop doing drugs. This basically means that all of us are addicted to our phones. It means that we have become, a phone and us have become one system. You can't separate one from another. And those are the things that psychologists of the future must actually study. So this is an example of the work that uh, was done by one of my students, Nadim Muhammad. You have a disease called epilepsy. So normally epilepsy is diagnosed, by, they put some machine in your head, it's called the EEG uh, a device, and then it measures brain activity and the doctor comes and looks at this and decides whether this person is epileptic or not. A study was done where they gave these pictures to hundred, they gave hundred pictures to hundred doctors, and they say, please, for each picture, tell me whether this is from a person with epilepsy or not. And then the doctors did this. They took whatever diagnosis the doctors uh, did and went and stored it away. After two weeks, they came back and gave the same doctors the same information and said, please, make another diagnosis. Half of them changed their minds. When doctors change their minds, it's called misdiagnosis. It means somebody who needed help was not helped. It means somebody who did not need help was not uh, given help. And we went and created an artificial intelligence device. This was almost 15 years ago and it is able to diagnose with accuracy of more than 99%, and it does not change its mind. Now the question is, how do we train the doctors of the future? I think the doctors of the future must be trained with technology. They have to understand technology much more than we are training the, 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 the doctors. This is another example of the work that we did. You know, when somebody has throat cancer, Normally what they do is to surgically remove the voice box. And after they have done that, 
the person can no longer speak. They can still move their tongue. So what we were trying to do here is, based on the movement of the tongue, can we be able to recreate what those people were supposed to say? So it's a speech synthesizer, so we designed this thing, and you can see how it ended, ends up being a signal, and this signal goes to a, a machine learning device, and it, uh, and it tells what the person was about to say, and it goes to a voice synthesizer. And the person's voice can be restored. Of course, a machine will be speaking, but what they intended to speak will actually be able to come. We actually have a, a, a US patent on this work, on how, how this thing actually works. So this is uh, another example. Do you know where this is? So this bridge actually collapsed. It collapsed uh, in Greystone Drive in, in Santon. So the question that uh, I did this with uh, this work with uh, uh, Dr. Wusisiwe Vilagazi. Uh, she is from Soweto. And uh, she did a master's with me, and then she went and completed a PhD in artificial intelligence at the University of Oxford, which she completed in 2012. And uh, she's now one of the five people who are trying to sort out ESCOM, the task team. Uh, so now the question is, could we have prevented this? Uh, I became an engineer because my grandmother was my first engineering teacher. <laughs> my grandmother used to make many things. One of the things that she used to make was clay pots. So she will go with me to, uh, to the river. I know many of you don't know that uh, clay is found next to the river. <laughs> you can't find it in dry places, you know. Uh, because it is clay, it has to be wet, it can't be dry. And then she will go there and she will select the point where she's going to collect the clay. Of course, the engineers call this material selection. <laughs> then she will bring it back and she will come and uh, form the pot. Now when you ask people to do a pot like that, they want to do computer-aided design. She did not know how to use computers, let alone computer-aided design. So she will do this pot. It's a round thing, but it has to be hollow inside. Because if it is not hollow, how are you going to put things you are supposed to cook? And you can't make the, the, the wall too thick. If, we, if the wall is too thick, then you need more fire in order to heat things, you know. So she will do this. Uh, she, 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 will, uh, she will then uh, put it in the sun so that it can dry. After it is dry, she will not go and cook with it because it's going to break. She takes it to the oven. And she goes to the oven, and then she bakes it. And afterwards, she will let it cool very, very slowly. I later found out that there is a German scientist called Boltzmann, who basically came up with the equation on how to cool things so that they don't crack. It's called, he even came with a fancy equation called the Boltzmann equation. My grandmother knew that you had to cool it very slowly, but she did not know who Boltzmann was, <laughs> let alone his equations. You know. <laughs> And after that, she will knock each pot to listen to how it rings. If it rings for a long time, then it is a good pot. Of course, when I went to study engineering, they will say it is lightly damped, which means you don't have any fluid that is trapped inside. If it rings for a short time, it's a bad pot. And she will throw it away. And after a while, I realized that she was throwing away good pots. You know why? Because her hearing was deteriorating. <laughs> so now, the question is, can we be able to design a system that will listen to a structure directly, take the signal to a computer, and be able to analyze that information and be able to tell you whether this is a good port or a bad port? And for this example, it will determine whether it is a good bridge or a bad bridge. And if it is a bad bridge, then you will have to stop the, 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 the construction and close the road until you fix it. It turns out now that you have technologies that are able to do that. So, this is really what the fourth industrial revolution is about. Using intelligent 
uh, uh, machines in order to solve daily problems. This is an example of the work that we did quite recently. You know, when I was still a young man, I wanted to be a dam inspector. The reason why I wanted to be a dam inspector is because in my village we have a dam, an underground dam. So you can imagine my village is very advanced. <laughs> but in this dam, there used to be one guy who used to come wearing a, a uniform and they would come and check things and they would write things and then they will disappear, you know. And that's the job that I wanted to do, you know. But now you can be able to monitor all these things without having to get somebody coming to monitor these things. So here is a technology that we developed that just uses the picture of a dam and it can be able to tell you whether it is losing water, at what rate it is losing water, and so on and so forth. We actually have a patent on this uh, invention uh, that we did with uh, our researchers. Uh. So now, what is the implications of the fourth industrial revolution? I basically think that we have to update our laws so that, um, so that uh, 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 they are in line with the fourth industrial revolution. And this has all sorts of Im uh, implications on how we teach our law students. <coughs> now, um, there was a self-driving car owned by Uber that killed someone. How many of you know about it? Who do you think is responsible for that death? Is that the engineer who designed the car? Exactly. We don't have laws that can be able to do that. I've already talked about um, how the fourth industrial revolution is discriminating against Africans. Because the African database is not very rich. How do we, how do we, how do we basically deal with that issue? We did some work not too long, um, about 10 years ago. I had a student called Mashaba Mashaba. Um, he actually died uh, two years back. May his uh, soul rest in peace. So we were worried about the doctors, the Cuban doctors in our villages who did not know how to speak the language. So we wanted to do an automated translator from Sisutu Saliwua. CPAD to English. So you speak in English and then it translates into CPAD. And you speak to in, in Sisutu Salibua and then it translates into English. That's really what we wanted to do. And we did this and it worked very, very well. So then we decided that we're going to do it with Corsa. <laughs> and that was when our problems actually started. <laughs> and the reason now, the reason why it was so difficult to do it with Corsa was because every time a click happened, it thought it was noise. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, but why, why is this the case? Then w the first reason was that Corsa only has 5% of his language as clicks. So they don't happen often enough for the machine to be able to learn. You know, we, only, we almost always think that Corsa has lots of clicks, isn't it? You know? It doesn't. You know? And the second reason was because you have a group of languages called Bantu languages. They are spoken all the way from South Africa to, uh, to Kenya. They are very similar. You know? uh, for those of you who travel through the continent, and we have a prog project called Africa by Bus, you will realize that whether you go to Malawi, whether you go to Zimbabwe, whether you go to DLC, when they speak, there are many aspects of what they say that you can hear. Because the languages are called one to They actually evolved from, from the same uh, 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 root. So all our languages are one to languages. But the indigenous, the, the, first, the, the, the first language in South Africa was actually Khoisan. And Khoisan language is not a, 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 a Bantu language. It's completely different from Bantu languages. And Khoisan is where the Khoisan language got the clicks. But it is still predominantly a Bantu language. Now the question is, how do you design technology that is able to handle a language that is a combination of two languages that are different, and one language is actually 
not as representatives in another language. Again, regulations and ethics so that people cannot be discriminated. Now, going forward, how should we teach people so that they are able to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution? The first thing that we need to do is that in the four, to understand what sort of skills are needed for the fourth industrial revolution. This is from the World Economic Forum. One of it is complex problem solving. Very, very important. It's no longer about remembering the facts. It is about how do you use the facts, because the facts you can get almost all the knowledge that is available on your phone. So how do you use it in order to solve problems? Critical thinking. How do we embed critical thinking into our teaching? Creativity. How do we embed creativity into our thinking? People management. Coordinating with others. Emotional intelligence. Judgment and decision making. Service orientation, negotiation, cognitive flexibility. Now, what you can see here is that the skills that are needed in the fourth industrial era are technological skills on one side and are human skills on the other side. You need both in order for you to be able to survive. And the only way we can be able to do this is by offering multidisciplinary educational experience. And we don't do it very well. We introduced something called the Africa Insights mod module about two years ago, which we require people to take. We don't do it very well. I was an undergraduate student in the United States at a place called Cleveland, Ohio. And I had transferred from uh, the University of Cape Town that was because the University of Johannesburg did not exist. Otherwise, I would have transferred. I wouldn't even have transferred if I was at the University of Johannesburg, you know, because it would have been perfectly good enough for me, you know. <laughs> so now, so when I arrive in the United States studying engineering, they tell me that I have to take 12 semesters of human and social sciences. 12 semesters. That's quite huge, isn't it? It's almost like you spend almost three years going to the Faculty of Humanities and taking classes. That's what we call multidisciplinary experience. So these were the courses that I took. I mean, the first co and this does not include the two compulsory courses uh, in, in physical activity that I had to take. So I took uh, uh, body conditioning. That's why I'm physically fit. Uh, and I took bowling. Uh, some of you might argue that bowling is not sports. But I went and took 12 semesters of human and social sciences. I took two psychology classes because the requirement was that six of them must be, can be in any subject you like, you randomly choose. But the other six must be, you, you choose the subject, but they must be in one subject. If you decide that it's going to be psychology, you're going to take six semester of psychology. If it is political science, you take six semester of political science. So I took two psychology classes. I thought I was going to take six, but I just couldn't handle those multiple choice questions in psychology. You know. And then I took um, three acting classes. You know, so the reason why I'm not on generation or iswaya it's not because of lack of talent. I'm actually quite trained in these things. You know. I took an uh, uh, introduction to acting. and Then I took a course called History of South Africa. You know, and these things are, you know, when you think about it, you say, but why are these things important? But they are very, very important. And in History of South Africa, one of the prescribed books was a book called The Dead Shall Arise. How many of you have read the book The Dead Shall Arise? It's a book on the story of a la young lady called Non Nawuse. Who, you still remember him? Hey. Yeah, exactly. You know. So the question is, are our engineering students learning about Non Nawuse? 
Now you might ask yourself, why is it important that you have to do this? So we, we went to, Google has a, 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 a system uh, that is called Google uh, Translate. You can go to it. Uh, and then in Google Translate, they claim that they can translate 103 languages. And one, one of those languages is Isizulu. So I went to Google Translate and I asked it a very simple expression. You can go and check it now. It does not understand what you are talking about. It basically says race does not matter or something like that. You know? <laughs> and the question is why? The reason is very simple. The people who are designing Google Translate are not Isi Zulu's native speakers. I mean, we know about uh, another Google device called Google Maps and how it pronounces our street names. So somebody somewhere forgot that there is something called an accent, you know, a local way of pronouncing things. So they basically got somebody from California to pronounce our street names. And of course, if you don't give people multidisciplinary educational experience, those are the sort of products you are going to get. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we giving our students enough multidisciplinarity for them to be able to adapt. Education is changing. Much of what we teach is already available on the internet. And much of it by some of the world leading experts. How do we teach in an environment like this? Uh, should we just go to the classroom and teach as we normally do? Or should we ask students to go and, re, uh, and, and watch videos. And when they come to class, we discuss what they have learned from those videos. I think they call these flipped classrooms. Those are the things that you need to think about. But those are the, the things that are coming to the fourth industrial revolution. Some of the best, world's best universities are offering free courses. You can literally go and take a course in artificial intelligence from Stanford University, being taught by one of the world's leading experts uh, 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 in artificial intelligence. So now, what do we do? Of course, there are, other, uh, 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 there are other consequences of the fourth industrial revolution that we have to, to think about. But I'm just gonna restrict myself to the issue of education. Now, robots, are robots going to replace our teachers? But you need to study this thing. You need to understand what can robots be able to do. You know, and we, you need to be able to design a new job spec for the teacher so that they don't, they don't do things that robots are able to do. They augment on what robots are able to do. So looking forward, I think we should produce skills for the fourth industrial revolution. Cognitive abilities are still very important. Having a broader view of things, the connect, seeing connectivity of things. This is called system, systems view on things. Uh, we, our, we should skill our people with problem, complex problem solving skills, and so on and so forth. And we will be able to do this if we give people multidisciplinary educational experience where human and social sciences understand science and technology and vice versa. Of course, the implications on society are huge, on the economy, on legislation, on education. I'm not gonna even spell out what the implications are. I, can, I think you, I know you have all the abilities to be able to now imagine how do I reposition myself as an individual so that I am not left behind in the fourth industrial revolution? It's not
not just business that... I thought um, uh, I wanted to play you a CNN video about the University of Johannesburg. W what are some of the things that are happening? How do I do it? Can you be able to hear? I think the, the, the easiest way is to put a mic, isn't it? I think, I think the, the, I don't think this is working. Why isn't it coming there? It's coming there. Are you sure? Yes. Work is actually happening in South Africa also positions us 
in terms of African solutions for African problems. Um, I think that where your inspiration comes from, and I hope my students feel exactly the same way, is that to have a VC who is so actively involved in cutting-edge research, in cutting-edge technologies, leaves us all with inspiration to follow in your footsteps. I think your uh, illusion in terms of the kind of skills required that um, people in general are going to require, including being lifelong learners. In other words, you can never stop in this game around FYR. You're going to have to learn all the time. Which means that the kind of students we have to produce are the kinds of students who are able to engage with learning on multi multiple levels, including self-learning including going to be able to find out. What I found most fascinating was really your start. The fact that your grandmother was the first engineering teacher. And I think every student sitting here has got almost an example of an organic intellectual, somebody that they have encountered, who the world may not recognize as intellectuals, but who certainly are intellectuals in their own right. So thank you very much for bringing that into our, into our consciousness. And now leave us with, please, a round of applause. Okay, um, good uh, still morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I'll try and, and go through some of my material quite quickly, but, uh, but there's some points that I really would like to, to cover. And I want to also give you, um, uh, as I was introduced earlier, uh, so an idea of the work that I'm doing, but also connecting it to you know, what sort of skills and learning I think should take place in the context of, um, of the fourth industrial revolution. So we are, as Prof presented earlier, we're living very interesting times, right? There's these breakthroughs in science and artificial intelligence, in robotics, in big data, and so on. Uh, and it's not only the breakthroughs in science, but also the applications of those technologies um, uh, into our daily life activities in health, in education, uh, in industry. So every activity, every workplace is going to be transformed. And that's, uh, that's, that's very exciting for some, and that's very scary for others, because it poses a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities. Um, the good news, as Prof. presented as well, is that we've done this before many times. We've done it at least three times. <laughs> so uh, we have adapted. We have come up with new systems, with new ways of learning. Um, and, uh, and there's nothing uh, that, that, that prevents us from doing it uh, one fourth time around. Um, the difference this time is that the, the speed of change is much quicker. Um, changes that took place in 50, 100 years before, now they can happen in less of a decade. Uh, so we need to think very, very carefully about how do we prepare ourselves um, uh, for this process. And all of these changes and technological, technological breakthroughs are happening in a context where we have to worry about climate change, about the depletion of our natural resources, about growing inequality, uh, and, uh, and very rapid population growth. These are the big challenges of our time. Uh, some say that our species has never faced um, uh, the, the extent of these challenges before, and most of the challenges are in the hands of, of, of your generation to solve. So there's not a better place to think about new forms of learning, new, um, uh, and, uh, and, and the type of uh, skills that are needed to solve these challenges in the context of uh, technologies and the, and, the, and, the, and the global challenges. I, I just wanted to start with this sentence, which I find very interesting by Richard Nelson. Um, he's an economist from, uh, from the United States, that in 1977 he asked this very important question, if we can land a man on the moon, why can't we solve the problems of the ghetto? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a question that was posed at the time for the, uh, for the American uh, economy uh, and society, but it's still very relevant in our days. This is our moon and this is our ghetto. We have the scientific knowledge to take a man to the moon and back safely. But we still are facing huge problems in our cities, with, uh, with crime, with um, um, uh, sanitation, poverty, growing inequality, and so on. So this is really how I want to place this whole story, right? Um, and uh, this whole story has a background, and it has a global agreement uh, that we have made as, uh, uh, as, as human beings and as countries to adhere to the, to, the, to the Sustainable Development Goals. How many of you are familiar with the SDGs? Can you raise your hands? 
not everyone. So this is something that everyone in this room should know about. Um, this is a set of goals that we have agreed in uh, 2015 uh, towards, um, towards eliminating poverty and hunger and preserving our natural resources and so on. It's all encapsulated in these 17 goals. Uh, and we can measure performance by um, tracing about 230 indicators to see how each country is performing in achieving these very important goals that have as a, as a general um, uh, a very ambitious goal of leaving no one behind. So it's not about reducing hunger and poverty, it's eliminating hunger and poverty. It's not about uh, acquiring gender equality, improving gender equality, it's about having complete gender equality. So it's, they are very ambitious goals to really um, get to the society that we, that we want to live in. Um, and uh, this brings us together to uh, issues that, that are acquiring prosperity, not only economic growth, but also uh, improving people's dignity and justice, uh, as well as preserving our planet. So it's really, um, it's really something that you need to familiarize yourselves with. Why does it matter to us? Because most of, do you remember the, the objective, not leaving no one behind? Most of those that are left behind, unfortunately, reside in our continent. So it matters to us uh, uh, more than anybody that uh, the, the sustainable development goals are achieved. Um, so there's no better place to think about these issues than in this classroom here. Um, uh, and some say that if the if sustainable development goals are not achieved in Africa, they will not be achieved in, uh, globally. <coughs> this uh, very quickly tells us how we're doing in the African continent in achieving the SDGs. And you can see that, um, and I'm not sure if you can read from, from, the, from, from the back, but these green ones is where we are moving towards the last mile. We're doing, we're almost there. We're going to achieve them by 2030, which is our target. Um, economic growth in less, less developed countries and mobilizing domestic resources. In the purple ones, we have slow gains, uh, meaning that we're falling short in achieving them. And those uh, orange ones are those that where we actually go in the opposite direction. We need to reverse the trend. We need to transform um, uh, those subsystems to be able to, um, to, uh, to achieve the, the SDGs. So where are these changes going to come from? Where are these great ideas to solve what our, our, our um, global challenges are going to come from? So in the African continent, we have the youngest population in the world. Um, you see that, uh, that the, the median age of our population um, uh, is much, much, much um, smaller than in, the, than in the rest of the world. So we, we are talking about um, a majority of the population that is be, uh, below 25 years of age. Uh, we have a, about um, 11 million people that are joining the, the labor market every year in the continent. And the African youth is going to be the largest in the world um, uh, in, in about 15 years or so. We have the, the largest labor force in the, in the world. So where are these jobs going to come from? Where are the jobs going to come from to um, 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 provide an livelihood for the growing uh, youth? So there are different estimations and there are different studies, and this is a study by the World Bank that tells us that if we look at how the youth is employed now, and if we make estimations about the future, we can see that a large portion of those jobs are going to come from what is called household enterprises, basically self-driven enterprises, entrepreneurship of the youth, creating your own livelihood. Um, and, and many of those are happening currently informally. So the informal economy is the story that I want to talk about because it matters to us, it matters for our future. Um, the informal economy, and how, how can we, um, um, the point is not preserving informality, but how can we draw from the, uh, the qualities of the informal economy and, and the activities that are taking place informally, how can we draw from those to build the future that we want? Um, and it's a story that sometimes sounds contradictory because I will talk about a little bit about innovation and about informality. And when you think about innovation and informality, sometimes they seem contradictory terms, right? You think about somebody that is doing rudimentary work, uh, selling something by the side of the road, like there's no technology involved and so on. And I want to tell you a different story about informality and, and, and very quickly give you a couple of examples of very innovative um, um, work that is happening in the informal economy. That, um, that, that can be useful for, for achieving the sustainable development goals and incorporating technology in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. So uh, in the African context, uh, informal is normal. 
Uh, and, uh, and I make this, po this point by showing that uh, about two thirds, sorry, I don't want to go too much into the figures, but about two thirds of uh, employment outside of agriculture is, is in the formal economy. So it's not a marginal thing, it's not something that happens in the, on the edges, it's really at the core of our productive systems. This is, we have to embrace the informal economy, it's here to stay, so we rather pay attention and unpack what is happening in it. Um, about one third of the continent's GDP uh, is produced informally, it generates most of the jobs, if you look at 90% of the jobs in, in Kenya in the last decade were created informally, 83% in, in Nigeria and so on. And it's on the rise. Um, we usually see it as a rudimentary, non-creative type of activities, but uh, the work that we're doing is trying to capture some of this uh, innovative behavior by informal entrepreneurs that are satisfying some overlooked gaps in the demand. And we are also trying to look at what is the potential for transformation, you know, to reverse some of those trends that we didn't, that we saw um, uh, in, the, in the sustainable development goals. Uh, another point is that they, a lot of the activities remain invisible um, uh, in existing conceptual approaches, particularly those that examine innovation. So this is um, um, just uh, quickly to show you one of the books that we released in looking at the informal economy in developing nations and innovation in it, where we look at innovation in different sectors, including um, uh, some South Africa. Um, let me not go too much into detail, but um, Despite the idea that innovation uh, is, is, um, uh, is uh, non-technological based, we found some examples of um, informal entrepreneurs actually adopting and adapting existing technologies uh, in a low-cost manner to service some of the, uh, the needs of the community. And these are, these, uh, these are some gas stoves, uh, sorry, these are some stoves, uh, wooden-based stoves, the, the ones with the, with the ceramic lighting uh, in red are more energy efficient, they produce less, less smoke, they use less wood, and they are much, much more energy efficient and they were produced informally. Uh, this is another example of, uh, of a chip cutter, to cut chips, uh, uh, and it was uh, an informal entrepreneur that uh, in, a, in a, an informal cluster in Kenya, um, by fixing one of these machines that was coming from abroad, actually realized I can reverse engineer this thing and I can produce this thing with cheaper materials uh, at low cost and produce, um, produce for, my, for my local demand. Then there's another um, manufacturer of matatus here in, uh, in Kenya, uh, and I won't go into this story, but there are, there are hundreds of uh, exciting and interesting stories of innovations that are happening in the informal economy. One of the interesting, and I won't go through the features of uh, innovation, how it happens, but uh, usually they rely on collaboration, on exchanging ideas. Um, a lot of informal entrepreneurs don't have the, the funds to do like the internal research and development. They don't have an R&D department <laughs> in, their, in their firm. So what they do is, and they don't have um, full knowledge about many things. So what they do is they exchange knowledge with each other. They collaborate. They, uh, they network and they use that to, to generate new ideas. They adapt and adopt existing technologies and sometimes um, come up with improvements uh, for the local market. They diffuse those very rapidly. So copying and imitation is something that is, is, you know, when we talk about innovation, we usually think about patents, about protecting your knowledge, you know, keeping it for yourself and then benefiting for that. And in the informal economy, you see actually the opposite. People copy and imitate, which may seem as a disadvantage, but when you have um, certain products that may be good for sustainable development, you want them to diffuse quickly. So the informal economy <coughs> is actually a, a, a good platform for that. Um, because they can't produce out of scratch, they minimize resources, they recycle, they repurpose, um, uh, they reuse. Um, so so uh, in that respect, they are extremely um, interesting examples for, for the sustainable, sustainable development goals. Um, let me just quickly jump to the, in the last uh, couple of minutes. <clears throat> I want to jump to, to some other ideas. So this is what is happening in the informal economy, but there's all this stuff that is happening in our continent that relates to more tech-oriented activities, but also that share some of these uh, principles of, uh, of the informal economy, of sharing and collaboration. And these are the maker spaces. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with maker spaces, but the number of tech hubs in Africa is growing exponentially. Many of them are co-creation spaces, 
and they um, they take different forms and shapes, but some of them they just look like this. There's just a table with shared tools where young people come around and they learn from each other. They share knowledge and they come up with um, uh, an, a, 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 how do they call it? A, a 3D printer that can print itself. Um, um, a drone that does so and so. They start playing with technologies related to the fourth industrial revolution and coming up with, uh, with new solutions just purely learning by playing and by, by sharing knowledge. Um, so they, they, they really adhere to uh, ideas of collaboration, to sharing, to peer-to-peer -peer learning, experimentation, and very much connecting to, to the communities in which they operate. Some really interesting examples from Kenya to South Africa, Cameroon, um, uh, on, on, on uh, startups that are starting to emerge from these uh, maker spaces, where they blend this high-tech te technological knowledge. You see 3D printers, um, uh, big data in some cases, algorithms, and all of these technologies that we're talking about, uh, mixed with a deep understanding of local needs. Um, what does the com my community need? Um, so I think this is a, this is a really important um, uh, aspect to, to keep in mind. And they're even experimenting with uh, new modes of education. They're calling it the maker schools, uh, where kids come and they, they teach um, students to be thinkers, to, um, to be solution-driven, to use hands-on exploration and learning, um, and, and with very, very interesting results. So this is my last slide. It's very, how do we, how do we take all of this, and how, how do we um, uh, materialize it in new forms of, uh, of uh, learning, teaching, and, and, uh, and education? So it's all about learning, and learning, and relearning. And there was a very interesting thinker, um, and futurist, uh, Alvin uh, Toffler, that, that said this. He said, the literate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, and learn, and relearn. Um, in a, it doesn't mean that reading and writing is not important anymore. Obviously, it's very important. But in a context of uh, rapid change, your knowledge gets very quickly obsolete. There's a, what you think you know suddenly changes. Uh, there's a new technology, there's a new advance. Um, so you need to unlearn and relearn constantly. So those skills are very, very important. And how do we, how do we train those? How do you nurture those? Um, as Prof. Manuela mentioned, through teaching critical thinking, um, by problem-based learning, you need to have this practical orientation of going to the community and using that as a learning space. Learning doesn't finish here in the classroom. There's many learning spaces. You learn in the classroom, but you learn in your community. You learn in your house. You learn with your, with, uh, with your um, uh, relative friends. You observe. And you, you use that knowledge, the deep understanding of the local needs, to blend it with existing technologies. And that is what is going to give us the, the solutions that we need for the future. Forget about this idea of teaching as a unidirectional um, process where the teacher holds all the knowledge, the student doesn't know, and we just pass on information to you. Actually, we need to move more towards sort of self-driven um, projects, where, um, where teachers become more coaches and facilitators of that, of that process. And I think that, re that requires quite a lot of um, responsibility from the point of view of the learner. So it's, you know, the teacher shouldn't be chasing you, you should be driving your own learning process. Um, Learning as a process of collaboration, co-creation, where you acquire those very important social skills that Prof was mentioning. How do you develop your empathy, your, your uh, interpersonal skills? Uh, well, you do that through teamwork, through collaboration. Um, and that has to be part of, of the way in which we understand curricula. And uh, finally, as Prof mentioned as well, there are a lot of ethical aspects of the fourth industrial revolution. So it's our job as teachers to also pass on to you um, these ethical problems and how to deal with them, with technologies in a way that you become informed citizens. Um, I think I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay, I know it's 12 o'clock and you are probably getting ready to go, but, but I think that our two guest speakers have left us with an amazing amount of exposure to worlds that you may or may not have been exposed to. So, I would just want to make one or two comments on Professor uh, Kramer Buller's presentation, just because I think for us, 
and where um, our conversations have been have certainly been about education being in crisis. It's certainly been about who are the children that are not able to access the kind of education that enables them into obtaining those 21st century skills. And so I think what Prof has brought into our consciousness is the fact that technology and innovations is not restrict restricted to the big corporations. That in and around township communities, in and around rural areas, and I think um, Prof Chivitsi also alluded to that around his, the stories of his grandmother and his own thinking as a young village boy, um, you know, thinking about a dam and, and the guy who comes to take um, records at the dam. I think where our work needs to go really needs to be beyond the classroom. And I think that that's the message from, from both presentations today. How does a teacher take the kind of technologies, the kind of innovations that are already happening in the surroundings where children find themselves and create awareness around the kind of technologies that children could use to be able to do some of the task and skills development that is required, but at the same time, how can you, within the current curriculum, because remember the curriculum is not going to be something that you are going to create, it's something that's always going to be probably given to you by some government, whoever they might be. How do you take that particular CAPS curriculum that you're working with right now and bring into the classroom these innovations, these kinds of thinking that propels children into the future that is rapidly advancing. I leave you with that question at the back of your mind, but I also want to say that I need for you to start taking notes on some of the ways this will happen because this continues the conversation in our class when I see you next week Monday. Have a beautiful rest of the day people. Thank you.